Good afternoon, everyone. We'll get started here. So it's my pleasure, uh, Dr. Michael James Osmussen, to introduce Dr. Michael James Monument. Uh, so uh, Dr. Monument is from U of C. He did his undergraduate master's here, as well as orthopedic surgery residency, which he did from 2005 to 2011. Um, after 2011, he left YYC and did a fellowship down at University of Utah, where he studied microsatellite polymorphisms in transcriptional regulation of Ewing sarcoma. And uh, currently, his research interests are surrounding uh, mouse models of bone and soft tissue, sarcoma immunotherapy, as well as surgical outcomes uh, for metastatic bone disease. And we'll probably hear a bit about that today. Uh, Dr. Monument's most uh, proud accomplishment is developing three transgenic mouse models of sarcoma that now become central infrastructure uh, for sarcoma immunotherapy here at U of C. Moving forward, uh, Dr. Monument will be using small molecule sting agonists to stimulate the immune system within sarcomas with hopes of translational to early clinical trials, hopefully within the next five years. A few fun facts. Um, Dr. Monument is an avid hockey player and fan, and during his fellowship at the University of Utah, he made the varsity hockey team at the age of 31. <laughs> so while playing in, in Utah, he broke two ribs, and as expected from any Canadian playing in U.S. collegiate hockey, he was second scoring on the team. And when he was down there to qualify to become a varsity hockey player, he had to take a yoga course. <laughs> And I think maybe his uh, yoga course had something to do with his uh, goal scoring accomplishments. Unlikely. And, <laughs> and you should take my word for it because I look like a yoga instructor with this, uh, with this hair. <laughs> so, without any further ado, though, um, Dr. Mike Monument will be talking about most models of sarcoma and immunotherapy applications. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think the broken ribs were, I was worried they were fragility fractures, getting a little old for college hockey. But uh, um, so I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons that, that works over at the Foothills Hospital. I also do a bit of work at the uh, Alberta Children's Hospital. And I also have a few different uh, research interests. Uh, along with is making some new genetic mouse models of a rare but very near and dear uh, type of cancer that affects a lot of uh, orthopedic uh, patients in uh, connective tissue called sarcoma. And we've been making some mouse models and now trying to use these models to develop some new therapies. I know it's a little bit uh, tangential uh, from some of the kinesiology research and human motion research, but still part of our, our major bone and joint initiative to do uh, better work and research for our, our bone and joint patients. Um, just a brief uh, outline of our objectives. Uh, I'm sure quite a few of you here haven't heard of uh, what sarcoma is, both bone and soft tissue. And I'll chat about some of the treatment challenges, both uh, surgical and systemic, and then get into some of the, uh, the basic science research that we're doing and uh, try and show a few caveat cases along the way. Uh, I have no uh, financial or commercial uh, conflicts to disclose. Um, so sarcoma is a broad uh, diagnosis for any malignant tumor, malignant neoplasm that's, that's derived from connective tissue. So whether it be bone or fat or muscle or some of the connective tissue around tendons and ligaments. In, in theory, it's tumors of mesenchymal origin. And uh, we can see big soft tissue sarcomas that develop in the muscle area or within the soft tissue compartments whether it be of the extremities or in the pelvis or the retroperitoneum. And as well, we can see aggressive malignancies that form within uh, the bone itself. Uh, sarcomas are, are very rare. So in the grand scheme of things, if you look at all cancers that affect the human population, represent less than 1%. So these are rare um, human diseases. But in the young adult and pediatric world, uh, sarcomas do represent about 20% of uh, solid malignancies. Uh, this is just some data from the uh, the U.S. surveillance uh, database, and you don't even see sarcoma listed anywhere in the top 10, and th these numbers are the same pretty much worldwide. Um, so there's, there's certain terminology that you'll probably hear me refer to as I go through this lecture, and a lot of the, the subcategories or the, the classifications of sarcoma are often based on the tissue that these 
these tumors or these malignancies originate within. So osteosarcoma is from bone uh, forming cells, chondrosarcoma from cartilage forming cells, liposarcoma from fat, uh, and so forth. Um, most people in Canada um, are familiar with osteosarcoma. That's what Terry Fox was diagnosed with. And uh, he, he was diagnosed just at the time when chemotherapy was being introduced for osteosarcoma. And actually, I just learned this not too long ago, but he actually declined uh, chemotherapy. It wasn't really well understood if chemotherapy worked at that point in time. So he had an above the knee amputation. And then throughout his marathon of hope, he actually uh, unfortunately developed lung metastases and died from his lung metastases. So uh, mo most Canadians actually are aware of sarcoma because of uh, Terry Fox and his, his um, iconic uh, Canadian uh, identity. Uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're very rare, um, very poorly understood. So big common cancers like lung cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, get a lot of the research dollars and a lot of uh, our basic science understanding of cancers comes from these models where sarcomas are, are poorly funded, poorly understood. And there's so many different subtypes. So this is just uh, pages from, we have a World Health Organization, it's like an encyclopedia uh, of all the different subtypes of sarcoma and there's over 60 of them. So it's very hard, they all act and behave a little bit different, but they also have some very common um, clinical attributes. So they're often large tumors, they're very common in the extremities, um, they're not, overly sensitive to a lot of chemotherapies of osteosarcoma and a few of the pediatric uh, bone tumors are uh, and they frequently metastasize um, to the lung. Um, lung is the most common uh, principal site that these tumors will spread and then grow in a new site and it's the biggest cause of mortality in sarcoma patients. This is just a CT scan showing these multiple cannonball uh, type lesions that are, are secondary to metastatic sarcoma. Uh, this is a gentleman's hand, one of my patients from a few years ago. You can see this thing is growing so aggressively, it's starting to fungate uh, through the skin. So the overall survival, this is pretty up to date, 2018, again, from the American uh, databases. Uh, overall survival for bone sarcoma is um, you know, under 70%, this is for five years, and even uh, worse for um, soft tissue sarcoma. Uh, the general treatment algorithm for bone sarcomas anyway, and it, it's pretty intense and it's pretty painful therapy um, for bone sarcomas like osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma, a lot of the pediatric and young adult uh, bone malignancies, they get chemotherapy through three or four months, you know, they lose all their hair, they, they, you know, they get all the systemic toxicities, and then they go for these massive surgical resections which is where, you know, I come into play or my colleagues as well, and then they get more chemotherapy after and they're about eight to 10 months in and out of hospital, very aggressive, toxic therapy. The therapy that we use for pediatrics is so toxic that most adults can't tolerate it. It's just when you're young, you can tolerate a lot more that we can throw at you. Uh, soft tissue sarcomas are much different. So most of them don't, don't respond to any form of chemotherapy. So we treat these patients with a very high dose of radiation. So this is radiation that's a high enough dose that can actually give you a secondary cancer down the road at such a high dose. And then we treat them with big surgical resections. And there's a few exceptions to all the rules for both bone and soft tissue uh, sarcomas. And like, as I mentioned, the radiation toxicity is, is pretty intense. Wound healing problems, fibrosis, muscle wasting, stiffness, joint contractures. If you have to radiate a child, it arrests their growth plates and they get limb length uh, inequalities. And then this is just uh, a good survival curve, probably from the last major clinical trial that showed a, a massive survival benefit in some of the, the chemotherapies that our medical oncologists will give sarcoma patients. But I really wanted to highlight this. You just see the massive discrepancy in the survival of patients that have isolated disease versus patients that present with or develop you know, pulmonary metastases. And no matter what interventions we have introduced, new medications, new therapies, this curve has remained pretty much the same. So getting into, I hope no one um, gets too queasy with any intraoperative photos. I've got a few photos of what we do from a surgical standpoint. So as an orthopedic surgeon, I'm trained to, to do a lot of bone and muscle and extremity based surgery, a lot of joint replacements. And now I've sort of done extra training to do some of the, the orthopedic work that's involved in cancer resections and reconstructions. So once these patients have gone through their chemotherapy, they get what's called an, an on block or wide margin resection. So in this case, this is an osteosarcoma. In the distal femur, you can see the big bone forming tumor coming out. This actual shadow here is the soft tissue mass. It's extending out of the bone. And we'll do the 
entire resection. So we resect the whole knee joint itself, all the ligaments, the menisci, and uh, we reconstruct the joint. So this is what it would look like at the time of surgery. So this is where we've made our bone cut here. The extensor mechanism is over here. And then now we've put in our metallic uh, implant. So we've entirely replaced the knee end as well, the, the end of the femur bone. And that's just what the, the x-rays uh, would look like. And, you know, implants go all the way down the tibia. Uh, for the soft tissue sarcoma world, again, they're not sensitive to radiation therapy or chemotherapy. So we treat them with external beam radiation. And then we do, again, massive, uh, you know, resection. So this gentleman uh, lost all of his uh, VMO. He lost all of his uh, medial quadricep. Um, you know, the wound barely gets closed uh, over top. The skin's all fibrotic and they're pretty morbid resections. And we do have a lot of challenges with these patients after. So this is a, another patient of mine. This is a young girl, about mid-20 or 28. Um, she had a, a synovial sarcoma. It's a type of soft tissue sarcoma. And it was essentially interdigitating between her toes. Uh, the foot wasn't um, savable. So we had to do a below-the-knee amputation on her, which, you know, a below-the-knee amputation, a young motivated patient with a good prosthesis actually does really, really well. Um, and she has done well. And then um, we're seeing her in surveillance now when we've scanned her chest and she has a, a lung nodule after a long stand, you know, at least a year of uh, surveillance. And the systemic chemotherapy options now for her are quite limited. And, uh, you know, 30% will respond to chemo. And that just means it stops growing for a, a short period of time. Median survival is 12 to 19 months. Um, not to be too dreary or anything, but I think this highlights just the need for new therapies. Here's another example of a patient with a, a chondrosarcoma, so a cartilage forming lesion. You can see these little arcs and whirls within uh, this big massive lesion within the femur. And again, uh, on block resection uh, requires removing that entire segment of femur. And uh, we reconstruct it uh, using a segment of bone from the bone bank. So this is cadaveric femur that's been processed and sterilized. We, we prepare it and cut it and try and shape it to the size of what's left of her remaining hip joint and as well the knee joint. And then we fix it all together with, uh, with plates and screws. So this is you know probably a, an eight hour surgery uh, to do all of this stuff. And this is one of her first follow-up x-rays. You can actually see a little bit of early uh, callus uh, formation. Um, so she's, she's trying to lay down some new bone and actually heal this, which is pretty impressive because you're trying to dock live bone to, to dead bone essentially. And then, unfortunately, I got a phone call. She admitted to emerge with shortness of breath. And sure enough, she has um, lung metastases. And again, the systemic options are a bit limited. So um, these are, are some of the, the major challenges. Some other challenges that we have from a surgical standpoint is these tumors are massive, some of them. Uh, there's a lot of bone and muscle loss. Uh, losing your quadriceps and you know, someone who's 20 or 30 years old is a pretty morbid thing to go through. Uh, in children, we have to augment uh, growth of the growth plates and we have to remove joints and there's permanent you know, musculoskeletal disability associated with what we do. Uh, here's a couple other pictures. This is the biggest sarcoma I think I've resected from someone's uh, extremity so far. So this is a liposarcoma. So this is a fat-derived uh, uh, cancer. And you can see how you know, massive this tumor was. Replaced this entire quadriceps. And uh, you know, this thing grew pretty rapidly on the guy as well. Um, this is another picture of, a, of an osteosarcoma in, I think she was about a 16- or 17-year-old female. And... Uh, uh, it involves the entire upper part of the humerus, so where the rotator cuff attaches to, where the deltoid attaches. So our surgical resection, um, you know, the entire insertion or footprint of the rotator cuff is gone. Her, her humeral head is gone. Some of her deltoid is gone. And it makes the, re the reconstruction really difficult. So we, again, use cadaveric bone with a combination joint replacement, and we put the joint replacement to the cadaveric bone and then dock it to her, her host bone, hoping that it'll heal heal at this junction. We, we use cadaveric uh, rotator cuff to try and reapproximate the, uh, the, her, what's left of her rotator cuff. Uh, but for a 17-year-old girl, the best she's going to get with this arm is sort of elbow function and maybe, maybe forward flexion or maybe abduction to about 90 degrees. But anything overhead is, is never going to be possible for her. And then here's an example of what we do in some kids where we still have open growth plates. So the, the most active growth plate that's responsible for most of the longitudinal growth is at the distal femur. So we unfortunately have to resect the distal femur for this osteosarcoma. And we can use implants that actually 
have a growing component built into them. So we just put a little screwdriver into the knee and we just dial it up and it grows over time. It's actually kind of a cool thing. And then this is another really wacky procedure we do. This is um, um, a kid, very young. So I think this was an eight year old kid at the time that had a Ewing sarcoma, so aggressive bone sarcoma. And we actually remove, we do what's called an intercalary amputation. So we remove the entire uh, femur and as well some of the tibia. And then we rotate the foot 180 degrees and we reattach what's left of the foot back to the femur. And it kind of looks like this. Um, so this is now the end of the femur bone and we've re-approximated and rotated the foot 180 degrees. And it looks really wacky and bizarre, but the bone heals and now this kid can function like a, a below the knee, you know, amputee with a good prosthetic. So it's a bit morbid from a, the cosmetics and, and, and obviously there's some psychosocial ramifications of this, but very functional. And, and, you know, this guy used to send us photos of him wakeboarding and skiing and running. And one of his favorite things to do was stick his feet out the window when he was in the car. So one foot was up and the other foot was down. So they, they do develop pretty good, um, you know, sort of tolerance. And, and it's amazing how durable kids are in regards to rolling with some of the things we have to do. You know, so all of this morbid talk and all of these uh, bad photos, I mean, it really does highlight, you know, that we need better therapies. We need therapies that can shrink these tumors down. So if someone has a, a tumor in their quadriceps, it's the size of a watermelon. If we can shrink that down to the size of a lemon, uh, that certainly would make their surgery a lot uh, less morbid. It would allow us to have better surgical margins. It would improve our limb salvage. And then furthermore, we need, you know, less toxic therapies that don't involve being in a hospital for 10 months and losing all your hair and, and you know, nausea and diarrhea and all that stuff. And then it's, it's really a, a, an urgent problem right now. But anytime a patient relapses or develops metastatic disease, we, we don't really have any, any therapies for them. So this moves into the, the next part of the talk, which is cancer immunotherapy. And this is an area that wasn't part of my research background when I was down in Utah, but there's a, a strong immunology presence at the University of Calgary. And there's a few researchers as well that are now collaborators of mine that are really dialed into immunotherapies. It's a really exciting field of cancer research. So these are a broad category of therapeutics where essentially you're, you're turning on the body's immune system to actually kill the cancer for you. So instead of giving patients a drug that, you know, attacks how DNA replicates or microtubules or some of the, the really, you know, toxic chemotherapies, there are now medications coming out that can just stimulate your immune system to actually hunt and seek and destroy uh, your cancer cells. So this example of cancer cell and a T cell and you activate the T cell to now recognize the cancer cell and the T cell will gobble it up just like it would, uh, you know, an infected cell with a virus or like a bacteria. And, and the results have been um, staggering for other types of cancers. So when I was in training uh, and, and I had, you know, you, you would run into a patient with metastatic lung cancer that's, that's, that's lodged into the femur bone, the, the survival numbers were, you know, six months survival for these patients. But now there are studies coming out, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, that is showing, you know, massive survival improvements, almost double the survival. So patients now are surviving two and three years with these metastatic uh, cancers. And so there's been obvious motivation to, to try and figure out if these immunotherapy or these categories of drugs will work in sarcoma. And so far, there's been a couple um, early phase clinical trials, and they just don't work in sarcoma. There's been a few subtypes that will respond, meaning that they will be stable disease, maybe 15% will stop growing for a period of time. But really, the, the immunotherapies have not been successful. And the major thinking to that is, is sarcoma is if you were to look at, a, say, a lung cancer or a melanoma or a sarcoma under the microscope, a major, major difference will be that the lung cancers and the, and the melanomas have tons of immune cells. So they're chocked full of uh, T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and macrophages and other sort of immune cells. So the immune cells are actually in the tumors. They're just kind of silenced. Where in sarcomas, we call them cold tumors. They're just not inflamed. There's no immune, immunogenicity within the tumor. And so if you give this patient with a cold sarcoma medication that's supposed to activate the immune system, and there's no immune system in the tumor, it's just not going to work. So that kind of leads to, can we develop some alternative strategies to recruit and activate T cells within sarcomas? So my, my lab has been looking at developing some mouse models of sarcoma in a fashion that we can actually make mouse models that have an intact immune system, and then we can start testing out some of these new immune-based therapies. 
So when I first got back, and this has you know, been a labor of love and patience, it's been about four years now, um, we first started trying to make these, these transgenic sarcomas and specifically on that C57 black six background, as it means we can do more downstream immune-based uh, research. If we have a tumor that grows in a mouse and that specific inbred strain, then we can transfer the tumor to other mice of the same background and test some cool new immunotherapies on them. So the first approach was we were starting to breed mice with different modified genes in the world of, you know, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. So we have a bunch of mice that we purchased and we've been breeding together. So P53, one of the most common tumor suppressors, P10, RB1, these are all major, major tumor suppressors. Uh, this KRAS uh, genetically altered gene is, is an oncogene that when it's turned on, it, it, it causes a lot of, uh, you know, cancerous growth. So we've been mating mice together with different uh, genotypes of these alleles, trying to get mice, say for instance, that's, that's homozygous for P53 and heterozygous for, for KRAS. And then we inject these mice either into the bone or into the muscle with a virus containing this, uh, this enzyme called Cre recombinase. And it, the Cre recombinase acts on these, these modified genes and it deletes them or it turns them on and it allows us to do site specific anatomically targeted mutations in the right genes in the right anatomic location to try and make these sarcomas. Uh, the first mouse that we, we started with was a homozygous P53 conditional mutant and as well a KRAS heterozygous conditional mutant, mostly because these two genes are very commonly mutated in sarcoma. We tried intramuscular injections. We tried making a little hole in the tibia and injecting uh, the, uh, the virus into the tibia, the, the bone injections didn't work very well, but the muscle injections worked wonderfully. So these are just two different mice in about two to three months time, they start to develop these tumors. And it's amazing. Once they develop the tumor, it really takes off. It grows very, very quickly. And the mice reach their humane endpoint and get kind of sick and limpy very quickly. So we were pretty excited about this. Um, I'm fortunate we, I work with one of our pathologists, one of our sarcoma pathologists um, at the Foothills Hospital. And so we'll send her our slides and she helps us you know, provide that expert diagnostic opinion under the microscope. So this is what uh, they look like under the microscope. You can see here's the growth plate of the distal femur. These little triangular uh, wedges are the menisci. Here's what's left of the tibia. We probably lost a little bit of the tibia with the decalcification. And all of this blue stuff here is all uh, sarcoma, higher power magnification, pleomorphic, mitotic figures, very aggressive looking uh, tumor. We ran some stains on it and it stains with skeletal actin, uh, also stains with uh, the muscle uh, lineage transcription factor, myogenin D. So that gets a bit of a broad stroke diagnosis under the microscope of a myogenic or a muscle derived uh, soft tissue sarcoma. And it could be a rhabdomyosarcoma or it could be this other entity called undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma. Pathologists really like to make up long wordy names and it's, it's amazing. And every three or four years, they make up a new name that we have to remember. So this is actually a relatively new term in the last decade that they've termed uh, to this type of cancer. So we ran some genetics on it. We did uh, whole transcriptome sequencing and then compared the gene expression profile of these tumors to the human database. So the TCGA and array express human databases of different cancers. And we had a bioinformatician help us out with this, but essentially we could see that our, our mouse muscle clustered closely with human muscle and our mouse tumor uh, clustered closely between the synovial sarcoma and this UPS. And we did some further genetic analyses on it. And sure enough, this is genetically an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma which is great from a model standpoint. This is actually the most common adult soft tissue sarcoma. It's very aggressive. It's not sensitive to chemotherapies. So it's a perfect model to study in our world of making something that we can now um, put into an immunotherapy type context. Um, and then the other goals were to, can we transplant these spontaneous tumors into a new mouse of the same inbred strain? And sure enough, we can put as little as 10,000 cells into the gastroc and they grow large tumors in two to three weeks time. Uh, they're not, they're not metastatic, at least in the two to three weeks time before they get too large to, uh, uh, that we reach our humane endpoints with the mice, but we can inject them into the tail vein of the mouse and they'll grow wonderfully in the lungs as well. And we've now, I mean, this is a little bit out of date, this slide, but we've probably got about 40 mice now. The penetrance uh, is quite high, 90 to 95% penetrance, and the latency is good. So we can do our viral injection 
and within you know probably within two to three months we have tumors to work with so you don't have to wait a year and a half to, to develop tumors so the next question is is can we understand the immunology of these these um, sarcomas better so we've done a bunch of flow cytometry trying to characterize what immune populations are actually in these sarcomas and you can see with this figure here, CD4 uh, positive lymphocytes, CD8 positive lymphocytes, these are uh, tumor associated macrophages, and these are myeloid derived suppressor cells. And there's not a lot of T cells in our tumor. Uh, there's definitely some macrophages there, but definitely not uh, a lot of T cells. So this is more and more looking like, okay, a cold sarcoma, just like that we see in humans. We compared our results to another mouse model that's actually an inflamed, sorry, I spelled inflamed wrong, but inflamed uh, rhabdomyosarcoma. This is a model that's traditionally chocked full of T cells. And if you can compare this highly inflamed model to ours, you can see we're quite deficient in uh, T cells. And then we tried some of those new immunotherapies, those new checkpoint inhibitors that you may have heard about in the news or in the media. These are the, the new anti, um, or these new immunotherapies that have, have made massive survival changes for cancer patients. And in our mice, they, they just don't work, uh, just like they, they don't work in the humans. And, and it's amazing, these um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are, are such amazingly powerful um, survival changing medications that they've already um, been awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery. Sorry, I'm paged. Um, which is pretty amazing because these were discovered in the early or to mid uh, 1990s and they're already receiving a Nobel Prize for this, which is pretty fantastic. Um, as a general of thumb, this is just a schematic that shows how these uh, immunotherapies work. So they are these, these normal, so cancer cells will find ways to upregulate proteins or molecules that essentially put blindfolds on your T cells. So you think of a melanoma that's full of, uh, that's full of lymphocytes. It's inflamed, it's a hot tumor, but all the T cells are blind. They have, a, they have blindfolds on, the, the cancer cell has tricked them somehow to not recognizing. And essentially, these checkpoint inhibitors block that relationship between the tumor cell and the immune cell, and it sort of takes off the blindfolds. And now these, uh, now these T cells can actually start identifying and recognizing the tumor cells and destroying them. Um, so I guess moving on here to the, the next objective here, um, which is more sort of up to date or sort of current uh, data that we're, that we're generating in the lab is we're trying to find ways that we can, we can bring in T cells into our sarcomas or how can we make our sarcomas more inflamed so they actually look like a melanoma now and then perhaps once we make them look like a melanoma or make them look like a lung cancer, they might be responsive to some of these checkpoint inhibitor therapies. So there, there's a, an immune pathway that's, that's received a lot of attention uh, recently. It's called the sting receptor pathway. So when you get infected with, say, a virus, you have a cold or something like that, the virus gets into your cells. And there is a very um, well-conserved well evolutionary system within eukaryotic cells that can actually recognize fragments of foreign DNA, foreign bacterial DNA, if you have an intracellular bacteria, more commonly foreign uh, viral DNA. And it recognizes the sort of metabolic byproduct of this foreign DNA, and it recognizes it, it goes into the nucleus, and it activates a series of events that, that upregulate very potent pro-inflammatory uh, gene expression. So this is called the, the sting receptor. And there's been some evidence that some of the genes turned on by the sting receptor are highly enriched in inflamed tumors. And there's even been some preliminary data to look at in other, in other models that if you actually activate sting, uh, you can bring in more immune cells. So we thought, well, we should, we should try this in a cold tumor. Can we can we turn on sting in a cold tumor to see if we can make um, more T cells, if we can bring in more T cells, if we can actually turn on the immune system to our sarcomas. Here's a little schematic. So here's the double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA, depending what virus infects, it gets broken down into some signaling molecules. It gets recognized by this sting protein, which is on the endoplasmic reticulum, and it leads to a cascade of phosphorylation events that go into the nucleus and start turning on type 1 interferons and a bunch of other like TNF alpha and a bunch of other pro-inflammatory um, uh, byproducts. And, and the, the output of this is that it activates antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells, the cells that are in your skin or the cells that are in your gut. It also activates and recruits T cells. So we did some pilot experiments. Uh, we took our tumor and we implanted a bunch of cells into the muscle. And we use this small molecular compound, we call it DMX just for short, but it's a small 
um, molecular activator of sting. And so we inject it right into our tumors and we've engineered these tumors so they, they fluoresce, they have bioluminescent properties to them so we can monitor in vivo without sacrificing the mouse. So here's just our control group. You can see at, at zero hours before we injected, this is just vehicle control. And then 72 hours, the tumor signal is actually still quite persistent. If you compare, you know, top to bottom, you can see in this case, the tumors, you know, you can see it's actively growing still. And then we were really surprised when we put in uh, this therapy into our, our mice, you can see it control and then 72 hours, you can already see massive reductions in the, in the tumor signal, in the tumor viability. Uh, we sacrificed these mice and looked at some of their tumors under the microscope and these sort of light pink areas versus the, the sort of dark purpley areas, these light pink areas represent areas of necrosis. So when a pathologist is looking under the microscope, oh, there's just a bunch of dead cells. It's almost sort of histologic soup in there. And what we also noticed is that we are starting to see in the periphery of the tumor, we're starting to see some lymphocytes showing up. And, uh, you know, that was pretty exciting. We're actually bringing in the right cells or the cells that we think are the right cells into our tumor. We did some fluorescent uh, immunohistochemistry as well on these just to look for different population of lymphocytes. So we see a significant rise in both CD4 positive, CD8 positive. So these are your helper T cells. These are your cytotoxic, your killer T cells. And uh, we've now done some more pilot uh, mice looking at longer durations so we can see you know, at two weeks, all of our mice that were treated were actually still alive, which was pretty impressive because the vehicle controls all had to be sacked at 14 days. Now it is a humane endpoint, so it's a little bit arbitrary, but uh, I promise the data gets more convincing. Uh, so this is now 21 days after you can see um, almost no signal in some of the mice and then a few of the mice seem to escape and develop uh, some recurrent tumors. So at day 42, we have five of six mice that are still alive. And then at three months, actually four of our six mice were, were totally alive without any detectable tumor. So we, we were just kind of, I wouldn't say playing around with this, but we were hoping that we could inject this agent to these tumors to make them inflamed so that we could then treat them with these checkpoint inhibitors. We were, we were a bit surprised that we actually had a pretty profound uh, treatment response like this. And we started trying to figure out, well, what's going on? Is this just a a massive TNF alpha surge and just necrosis within the tumor, or is it a macrophage mediated thing, or is it really a T cell mediated event? So if it's a, a T cell mediated event, there should be immunologic memory, meaning that if you rechallenge, um, just like when you get a vaccine, um, if you rechallenge with that virus years later, you have memory to it, you can develop a quick and uh, effective immune response against it. So we thought, well, let's try and re-inject tumor into our surviving mice and see what happens. Um, so again, we used control mice, uh, injected tumor. These are mice that weren't previously treated. And then we took our four of six surviving mice and, and re-challenged them in the other leg. So the contralateral hind limb. And this is what they looked at at day zero when we first put in the cells. And then five days after challenge, you can see the vehicle controls are the ones that weren't treated, developed pretty robust tumors. And already within five days, we have complete obliteration of our tumor signal. And uh, 20 days rechallenge, uh, 30 days rechallenge, and uh, someone someone asked, well, maybe it's because you've got this foreign luciferase protein, uh, you've got some foreign antigens that are maybe in the in the engineered cell line that we made. So we've actually repeated these these poor four surviving mice have really been workhorse for us because they've been injected with cancer about six different times. Um, but we re-injected with, with cell lines that had no genetic modifications to them. They didn't have any luciferase or any uh, m cherry expression, and they still rejected the, the, the tumors. So that would certainly suggest that uh, there's some immune-mediated response that's not just an engineering construct, although you could argue maybe the, the Cre recombinase that we used to engineer the, the knockout deletions in the first place. So uh, this is now sort of on to the next experiments that we're, we're planning to do is whether or not we should look at some um, mice that are deficient in T cells or deficient in other limbs of the immune system to try and figure out the exact mechanisms of how this is working. Uh, we've repeated uh, these experiments uh, again with more mice and again the results uh, are very um, reproducible that we have massive reduction in uh, our tumors. So we've now um, treated uh, looks like 11 mice and our survival is, is, is fantastic. So this is pretty cool preclinical data. Obviously, there's a lot of work still to be done. As I mentioned, uh, some future directions are to actually look at um, mice that are deficient in T cells 
um, to maybe test this in a more surgical model where we maybe resect the tumor and then try and challenge them for recurrence or see if they develop metastases. And then we've recently created an osteosarcoma mouse. So this is just one of the newer models that we've developed in the last six months. So this is a needle injecting that virus into the growth plate. It's a, a different genetic background. So it's a mouse that's modified to have deletions in P53 and P10. And you can see here on this uh, photomicrograph, this massive bone forming tumor that's almost exploding out of the tibia. And we'll be starting to test this drug in, in a different sarcoma model as well. And then I guess the final um, future direction, and, and I, I just saw a patient on Monday um, actually has the exact same human equivalent uh, sarcoma that we've developed in our mice. And I resected all of his anterior thigh, all of his quadriceps, his femoral nerve. It was just all involved with the tumor. And at his first surveillance visit postoperatively, he's got metastases that are all the way up his lymph nodes into his abdomen. And there's really no, there's no surgery that's left for him. He can try some chemotherapy, which is unlikely to work. And it really just highlights that, you know, we got to get to the point where we take some of these exciting preclinical models and, and, and develop some phase one trials. And there's a company that's actually developed a human, um, a human sting agonist. And uh, there's some phase one trials that are getting pushed forward with melanomas and lymphomas. And I think we're, you know, if we can get some more good preclinical data, I think it's something worth exploring. So 38 minutes, I went through that pretty quickly, but I was told it was kind of a 30 minute talk. So I tried to keep it. Uh, um, I just like to thank uh, all the members that work in the lab and some of my collaborators. Uh, McKeg Institute's been very, very supportive. I'm still in that sort of new investigator, young investigator phase where you're trying to kind of climb your way out of the barrel and, and make it rain. So it's been a lot of support and um, hopefully we can continue to keep doing this stuff. So thanks for your attention. I'd love to take any questions you have about the clinical side or the basic science side or both. I know it's not limbs and joint analysis. <laughs> Uh, so at the end, you said that they're like they're moving into phase one clinical trials for lymphomas and yep. other types. But, so what are the barriers then to moving into these sarcomas? Well, it, it's it's the one nice thing about sarcomas is because we're always behind the eight ball in, in that regard. A lot of these new compounds and therapies get beta tested in another population, which which really matters for the pediatric side. It's really hard to get early phase one studies in your pediatric population, just the ethics and some of the regulatory barriers are a lot uh, more intense. And so if there's already a phase one trial that sort of looks at some of the dose toxicities and some of the side effect profiles, it gives us a good window to, to sort of parachute off of that. There's um, a clinical trials unit at the Tom Baker Cancer Center where there's a lot of funding and infrastructure, which I'm just sort of learning about as I'm starting to kind of knock on the door a bit and figure out how it all works. But there's, there's people that are paid and there's resources that are there to help a uh, physician or, or clinician initiated trials and, and stuff like this. So I think, um, you know, a couple of years of preclinical data, if the preclinical data kind of justifies the next step, we'll probably have some early phase one from a few other models to, to help us get through, which would be awesome. All right, will someone without the name Mike want to ask a question? Wow, three mics. <laughs> All right, I'll ask the question then. Yeah. Uh, so why does the sarcoma always spread to the lung to do that? It's an amazing question. Um, so the, the standard um, spread of most cancers, like breast cancer, lung cancers, usually thought to be in the lymphatics. Most sarcomas don't spread through the lymphatics, although the, you know, as I mentioned, that patient that I saw on Monday, his clearly did. So we, we think it's some element of, of spreading through the actual arterial you know, circulation or venous return to the heart and then the arterial circulation. And there's probably something, you know, that sort of seed and soil hypothesis, something about the lung that, uh, that allows these sarcomas to either home there or once they get wedged into the small little capillary vessels within the lung that they can actually just start extravasating and, and growing in the lung parenchyma. So that's actually a, a very important question that no one knows the answer to for sarcomas. Do you see a genetic susceptibility in the general population for, for these types of things? Yeah, so there, there are a few um, conditions, a few germline mutations that are associated with extremely high risk of uh, sarcoma. So Lee Fraumini is uh, a classic uh, germline mutation of P53. And so sarcomas, I think, are the second most common malignancy that those, those patients and those families develop. 
Uh, retinoblastoma syndrome is another one, the RB1 gene. They get retinoblastomas and also develop uh, sarcomas. A lot of those kids are irradiated around their orbit for their retinoblastoma, and then they develop a secondary osteosarcoma in the bones of their face. You mentioned that you use uh, cadaveric bone, and mm -hmm. there's also cadaveric muscle. You're talking about the rotator cuff. Yeah, so we, we, we don't use any cadaveric muscle, but we definitely will use cadaveric, you know, ligaments or tendons to try and, you know, reapproximate whatever's left to say, you know, if we're, if we're doing, for instance, a, a joint replacement around the knee, sometimes we'll use a cadaveric tibia and then we'll weave what's left of their native patellar tendon into the cadaveric patellar tendon to try and get some integration and some healing. Most of the cadaveric work we do is bone. It just... The bone is dead. Uh, you can get a little bit of host bone to dead bone integration at the docking site, but the remainder of the length of the bone is just, it, it's no different than a prosthesis. It just has more of a biologic interface to it. So do you, do you need to store it in a specific way when you harvest it? Yes. Yeah, so th there's um, there's a, a sort of a bone, well, there's a soft tissue harvesting program that's always actually going on at the Foothills Hospital. I even think the kids' hospital as well. I mean, at two in the morning, three in the morning, if a big motor vehicle collision comes in and someone's a, a donor, they'll they'll collect what they what they need to, and it gets processed and sterilized uh, to make sure there's no sort of foreign proteins that you would develop like a graft versus host uh, reaction to. So it's really just the the substrate and the lattice work of the bone uh, that's left, and then it's stored in the freezer at minus eighty. And we we literally have a little book, and I you know I'll, I'll say I need a femur today, and the nurse will go check and see if we have a femur. If not, they either order one in, or sometimes we have to wait for a little bit until we get a new one, which is kind of dark, but waiting for one to come. The other thing I was wondering is, and you answered it partly in your talk, because I was wondering when you, you know, make a joint replacement or you know, any kid, and the kid grows, uh, is growing, and then you show that you can have this screw, mm -hmm. you, know, you can make the bone grow, but I, but I assume there's also a, like a sideways, a, a three-dimensional growing. Do you, do you have yeah. Yeah, that sort of appositional growth we we don't accommodate for. Um, yeah, and that's that's another deficiency of the technology that we have. And e even the the growing prostheses, some of them need to be swapped out when they get to an adult age because they, as you extend it out, it's not as mechanically solid anymore. It's sort of like a, a tube in a tube that's fully extended. Now the torque in the lever makes uh, for some mechanical insufficiency. And uh, they develop flexion contractures. If you lengthen them too quickly, you can get some nerve palsies. So it's still a very, you know, imperfect uh, technology. But, but it's not that you have to go in there every four years as they grow and, and get a new joint. And no, no. But because we, we treat them with such high dose cytotoxic chemotherapy, the, the chance of infection, an infectious complication in a patient that's on, you know, chemotherapy with their white count is almost non-detectable in their blood is about 10 to 12%. So for a, a standard hip or knee replacement, if you have arthritis, you're 65 years old and have arthritis, your chance of a deep joint infection is about one in 200, where you're 10% if you're a sarcoma kid that gets a joint replacement. It's just such a, a sick patient going into a big procedure. You know, when you talked about your immunotherapy, uh, it reminded me almost like, uh, like could you potentially in the future get a vaccination to protect you uh, from cancers because you, you, you build up your immune system somehow like you showed for the mice that had it once and then mm -hmm. they survived and yeah, a few, a few of these sarcomas actually have genetic recombination events where you, you have a translocation you, you, and then they, they make this novel fusion protein. And there's definitely labs that are trying to look at using epitopes from that fusion protein as a novel vaccination strategy. And there's even some immunotherapy researchers that are developing. So you're taking T cells out of your body and you're culturing them in the lab and then you're infecting them with with new genetic information to make a receptor on that T cell that actually recognizes what you know is expressed on your on your cancer cells. So it's a, you know, they call CAR T cell therapy, where they, you know, they engineer a new receptor on the T cell to now fight your cancer cells, which in theory would work wonderfully. But again, if you have a tumor that somehow doesn't allow T cells to get into it, you're going to have all these engineered T cells floating around, but they're just kind of bouncing off the tumor and not getting into it. Just a very technical question, stupid question. You know, when you show those cancers with the little colorful blots, mm -hmm. what, what is that actually that you're showing us there? Yeah, so the 
the um, the signal that you're seeing. So these, yeah, those, those little blocks. yeah. So we we engineer when we took our spontaneous tumor, we developed the cell line from the tumor, and we engineered it to express the uh, firefly luciferase uh, enzyme. So we just inject it in the belly with luciferin, and the tumor will light up when when it uh, metabolizes the uh, the then, substrate. Then you capture that how. Yeah, we've got a, we put them in a little, um, in a little device that captures their sort of bioluminescence. So it's just a little camera, a little dark room that, that captures how many photons they admit from the, from the tumor. And, and then the, the scaling there, the intensity reflects just as Yeah, so as you go up the scale, there's more, more photons per second that are being liberated by the tumor, which means there's just more density of tumor there. So you have all these cells expressing luciferase. If you have 20 million cells expressing luciferase versus only 10,000 cells, you'll get much more photon um, emission. So the red in this case would indicate a large density or a large, you know, signal of, from the tumor cell where something blue is, is less. So you'll always see the blue in the perimeter and the red in the, the center where the tumor is focused. Great. Thank you. Fred? Uh, I, I'm assuming that one of the ways that you sterilize cadaver bones, you irradiate it. Mm -hmm. Does that do you worry about what that does to the mechanical properties of the bone? Does it matter? For sure. So if you go, see if I can, how quickly I can go back. Um, for small bone allograft reconstructions, we, we don't get too worried about it. We usually span it with plates and screws anyway, but uh, sorry, it might take me a few slides. But for some of the larger bone. Just like that little square. With the... This guy here. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So in this one, um, so I actually milled up and down the bone and I injected uh, bone cement into it. So it's got polymethyl methacrylate um, up and down the, the canal of the cadaveric bone because you expect the bone to be not as mechanically sound. It might resorb a little bit over time. So you, you, we, we add a bit of cement to, in theory, increase the sort of the durability of the bone, but yeah, it's uh, now if you if you get robust bone healing and you get some good bone integration, um, you know your chance of success of this allograft is much better than if it doesn't ever integrate over time. The plates and screws will fail. Okay, so once you do get integration, you never see increased resorption and implant loosening or fixation loosening of the. Yeah, I would say if you put this on like an MTS machine or tried to, you know, if you took this bone and tried to stress it with number of cycles, it would fail for sure quicker than sort of a live, you know, femur would. So there, there's no question that they still have some limitations to it. Um, you know, what, what the failure would be or, you know, if, if this patient went on to unremarkably heal both ends and said, can I go skiing? I'd probably say, give it a whirl. You know, are you at higher risk of breaking it if you fall compared to the other side? Yes, but what that number is, it's tough to really give them that answer. And, and naively, um, well, why is it better than a prosthetic? Why wouldn't you just want to lose a prosthetic? Yeah, so the, the chance of long-term loosening and, and sort of aseptic failure, non-infectious failure is definitely higher with a metal prosthesis over time. Now that's, that's somewhat based on the fact that the metal prosthetics are usually associated with the joint a joint replacement and the joint replacement does obviously have some sort of bearing to it. So a, a metal head in the hip that's articulating with a polyethylene liner in your socket and the, the debris from the polyethylene wear um, has resulted traditionally in, in, in what we call aseptic failure of, you know, hip or knee replacements. Now our polyethylene or some of the bearing surfaces that we're using now, now are way better than they were 10 or 15 years ago. We use ceramics on ceramics. We use metal on metals in some cases. So some of that might be historical reasons why we avoid the metal if we can. Yeah. Uh, what factors determine how well the, the live bone integrates into the dead bone? Yeah, so if it's been previously irradiated, so if the tissue's already been irradiated for some reason, it's unlikely to heal. Obviously the longer segment um, that you're working with is less likely to heal. Um, we we have devices where they're called intramedullary rods, where we can actually put a, a nail that goes down the actual medullary space of the bone. And if you use that technique, there's studies to show that the chance of bone healing is less with the rod. Where with the plates, we can actually put the plate on and we can drill the holes into the plate and the eventual screw sites in a fashion that when we tighten everything down, it actually compresses the bone together. So there's very well established techniques of causing compression at your docking site. And the more bone on bone compressed contact you get, the better. And you just don't get that with a rod down. 
a uh, younger age as well, kids will heal their bone way better than an adult will. In, uh, with the therapy that activate the T cells, is there any other side effects that come with in the mice that you see? Yeah, so so the mice look a little sickly under the weather for a couple days. They just look like they're all having the flu. Um, yeah, you definitely get a cytokine storm. And uh, in in some of the clinical trials with the checkpoint inhibitors, the one side effect that they're seeing, of, you know, the, the usual sort of fevers and chills and some of those flu-like myalgias, but they're seeing some activation or reactivation of autoimmune diseases. So these mechanisms that the cancer cells are hijacking are actually mechanisms that the body would use to settle down inflammation naturally. You have a whole bunch of T cells that are showing up and the body can find a way to silence the T cells. And now you're turning on all those T cells. So someone who might have Crohn's disease, for example, or rheumatoid arthritis, you give them a checkpoint inhibitor and it's quite likely they'll have a exacerbation of their disease. Yeah. So there, there are definitely some side effects. ask this question because I think it's really stupid, but is there any, with the funky surgery with the foot at the knee, mm -hmm. is there function preserved at the foot? Like plantar flexion, dorsiflexion? Yeah, it takes them a bit of time. So they have, you know, we usually only do this in kids and the kids will have a lot of plasticity, both in their soft tissues, but also in their neural mental circuitry. They'll work with a therapist for a year, but yeah, they eventually get, here, I'll show you the photo again they eventually get very good range of motion. So if you were to take us in the room and try and point your toes down that far, it's unlikely that any of us would be able to do that unless you've been training in sort of ballet or some sort of dance. But over time, these kids can develop more range of motion that allows them to get pretty good function. There, there's been biomechanical studies and sort of gait analysis studies to look at how does a kid with a rotation plasty with a prosthesis walk compared to someone who's got a distal femoral replacement and they actually walk better with the, with the um, uh, rotation plasty. And then the one nice thing, the nice benefit about this is this is his femur that's now completely healed to his own tibia. So he has no dead bone in there. He has no prosthesis. He just has the metal that was there in a transient fashion until the bone healed. And now his bone is healed. So he has a 100% biologic reconstruction where over time the metal would fail, the allograft would fail. Just in relation to that, are you using what muscles are you using to maintain that range of motion? Yeah, so so in this case, um, if we go back to say his primary tumor here, you know he would have lost you know some of his quadriceps, um, but we reattach. So when you flip the leg around, you're now attaching the origins of the gastrox and the soleus to now what's left of your extensor mechanism. And again, there's definitely some weakness that needs to be rehabilitated over time. Yeah, so we, we, we literally just will take whatever muscles are left, whatever tendons are left, and we'll mesh them all together. <laughs> Sounds a bit crude, but it works. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, why was it so much more difficult to get the cancer to take hold in bone than in muscle? Yeah, yeah so the, the bone is a very vascular site. So the bone is no different than a vein that you'd use for intravenous access. And actually in kids, when they come into the trauma bay, um, if you can't get a good IV in a kid and they need fluids quickly for resuscitation, you literally put a big massive needle right in their bone. And you can, you can resuscitate someone through the, the venous circulation within the bone. So you inject a, a viral particle or a viral based mechanism into the bone. It probably just doesn't stay within the bone for long. It probably just gets absorbed into their systemic circulation. And we noticed in some of those, those mice, we were getting some off target tumors. They were getting weird sort of enlargements of their spleen and what looked like some hematologic type malignancy. So the bone is, is a little bit tricky. That's why we, we sort of modified our technique with that latest model that I showed you. Um, so we actually, we under, when the mice are anesthetized, I take a little device and I just kind of break a hole in their tibia and I inject the virus right into their growth plate. So it's kind of away from that sort of, that sort of medullary space of the bone and it sort of keeps the virus more contained. Although these mice, it, it, it took about eight to 10 months for them to deform tumors. So it's a much slower process. Any more questions for Dr. Manya? All right, let's thank the one
right? Next week's speaker will be our own Sasha Tagoya, who will present on the effects of mental bending stiffness of sports shoes on lower limb biomechanics. We'll see you next week. Help yourself to coffee on the way out. And if you're down in the main lab, just say thanks to Glenda for, for buying the coffee again for the new year. See you next week.